At this time, I would like to present and introduce, and after I give his name, please give me a few minutes so I can tell you what he's going to be talking about. I would like to introduce a good friend of mine from down Canterbury Way, uh, although originally he was from uh, Illinois, I think he was born in Kentucky, but uh, I'd like to introduce uh, President Abraham Lincoln, presented by Jim Miller. Now, President Lincoln is going to talk about how the Republican Party got started in New Hampshire as a national movement, and he's going to present some observations about his trip to our great state of New Hampshire in, 19, in 1860, 1860, and he will conclude with a reading of, uh, I'm not sure whether it's going to be the Gettysburg Address or his second inaugural speech, but at this point in time, it is my honor and privilege to present to you President Abraham Lincoln, presented by Jim Miller. Especially in these 
these difficult times. A few words now to Republicans. It is exceedingly desirable that all parts of this great Confederacy shall be at peace and in harmony one with another. Let us Republicans do our part to have it so. Even though much provoked, let us do nothing through passion and ill temper. Let us have faith that right makes might. And in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. As I was saying, I arrived in Exeter, New Hampshire on February 29th, 1860, the home of my good friend Amos Tuck. Have you heard of Amos Tuck? I think his name is Tuck around. I came to speak to four Republicans, just like this wonderful gathering tonight. But really, my trip was here to visit my son. He was so far from home, we were still in Illinois at the time. On March 1st, I gave a speech in Concord, and then in Manchester. March 2nd, I spoke in Dover, and March 3rd in Exeter. And that wasn't the end of the trip. I was so speaked out at the end, I slept for a week. In Manchester, Frederick Smith, who was chairman of the Republican City Club, and someone who aspires to the governorship, I hear, introduced me as the future president of the United States. That was prophecy, but I didn't know it at the time. It surprised me almost as much as it did the 3,000 people that came to hear me speak. I know that there are now many issues important to the people and to the political parties other than slavery. In that light, you may take the liberty of substituting words in your modern minds of other more current abominations and tyrannies when I use the words slaves and slavery. If I may indulge, here's a taste of what I spoke about in my 1860 New Hampshire trip. About one-sixth of the whole population of the United States are slaves. One-sixth. The owners of these slaves consider them property. The effect upon the minds of the owners is that of property and nothing else. It induces them to insist upon all that will favorably add value as property, demand laws and institutions and public policy that will increase and secure its value and make it durable, lasting, and universal. The effect on the minds of the owners is to persuade them that there is no wrong in it. The slaveholder does not like to be considered a mean fellow for holding that species of property. And hence he's had to struggle with himself and sets about arguing with himself into the belief that slavery is right. Property influences his mind. Whether the owners of this species of property do really see it as it is, it's not for me to say. But if they do, they see it through two billion dollars. And that is certainly a thick coating. Certain it is, they do not see it as we see it. Certain it is that this $2 billion invested in this species of property, all so concentrated that the mind can grasp it all, <coughs> this immense pecuniary interest has an influence upon their minds. But here in the North, slavery does not exist, and we see it through no such medium. To us, it appears natural to think that slaves are human beings. Men, not property. I say we think, most of us, that this charter of freedom, the Declaration of Independence, applies to the slave as well as to ourselves. That the class of arguments put forth to batter down that idea are also calculated to break down the very idea of a free government even for white men, undermine the very foundations of free society. I'm sure you're all familiar with the origins of the great Republican Party, the prominent role played by New Hampshire in that founding. However, please permit me to recall and wax upon the details of those days, the days that produced such important changes and lifted such high hopes for this nation. Back in the 1850s, people opposed to slavery wanted a political voice. Some history books claim that in 1854, the Republican Party was formed to accomplish that in, of all places, Michigan. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is hogwash of the worst kind. I have an good report that our party really got its 
start in Exeter, New Hampshire, at the urging of my friend, Amos Tuck, on October 12, 1853. The meeting that day was a natural completion of something big that started at a gathering of 2,000 Friends of Freedom in Wolfboro that summer before. Northern Democrats, Whigs, Free Soilers, and faithful members of the Know Nothing and Liberty Party. Horace Greeley, you may know him as publisher of the abolitionist New York Tribune newspaper. He was another early Republican from New Hampshire. He heard about Amos Tuck's proposal for a new party to bring all the weaker groups together. And Greeley began in December of 1853 to champion the formation of a national Republican Party in his newspaper. Our party's original goal was to stop the spread of slavery in Western territories. In 1856, we chose John Fremont to run for president with the party slogan of free soil, free labor, free speech, free men, free month. I guess it wasn't a good slogan. <laughs> support from the South. The election of 1860, largely because of the efforts of your New Hampshire delegation, I was chosen as the first Republican president. I sincerely hope that in the future, in spite of my faltering steps, there will be many more Republican presidents, perhaps even from as far away as California. <laughs> Here's something I said in 1861 that still rings true today. The world has never had a good definition of the word liberty, and the American people just now are much in want of one. We all declare for liberty, but in using the same word, we do not mean the same thing. With some, the word liberty may mean for each man to do as he pleases with himself, and for the product of his labor. Sounds like a Republican thing. While with others, the same word may mean for some men to do as they please with other men and the product of their labor. There are two not only different, but incompatible things called by the same name, liberty. And it follows that each of these things is by the respective parties called by two different and incompatible names, liberty and tyranny. In 1858, I declared that a house divided against itself, itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently, half slave and half free. I do not expect a house to fall, but I do expect it to cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it, and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate destruction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Before I go, I'll share a bit I wrote once about my background. Call it campaign literature. I was born February 12, 1809, in Hardin County, Kentucky. My parents were both born in Virginia, of understanding families. Second families, perhaps, I should say. <coughs> My father grew up literally without an education. He removed from Kentucky to what is now Spencer County, Indiana, in my eighth year. It was a wild region, with many bears and other wild animals. There were some schools, so-called, but no qualification was ever required of a teacher beyond reading, writing, and arithmetic to the third cipher. The little advance I have now upon this store of education, I've picked up from time to time under the pressure of necessity. I was raised to farm work, which I continued until I was 22. Then came the Black Hawk War, and I was elected a captain of volunteers, a success which gave me more pleasure than any I have had since. In 1846, I was elected to the lower house of Congress. I was not a candidate for re-election. 
From 1849 to 1854, both inclusive, I practiced law more assiduously than ever before. Yay. Amen. <laughs> I was losing interest in politics when the repeal of the Missouri Compromise aroused me again. What I've accomplished since then is pretty well known. You know, this time of year, the only time of year when lawyers walk around with their hands in their own pockets. <laughs> chance to use it at a second inaugural sometime next year. God will. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which is the providence of God must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove. And that he gives to both North and South this terrible war. As the woe due to those by whom the offense comes, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God should ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen for 250 years unrequited toil shall be sunk until every drop drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn by the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice toward none, with charity toward all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. I will conclude with a short dedication speech that I gave at Gettysburg this past November. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in the great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We've come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do so. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here are consecrated far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. But from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish. 